Shalom and welcome to the first program in a new four-part series, Violated Sexual Abuse During and After the Holocaust. For the first program today, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, Challenges and Reflections, we are honored to have two of the pioneers who researched this most difficult subject, Rochelle Seidel and Sonia Hedgepith, with opening remarks that will be delivered by Sharon Geva. And my name is Medin Shahar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as an educator and a guide, and will be your host for today's program. I want to welcome our global audience with a special welcome, as always, to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for the support and interest in our programs. This series is in partnership with the Remember the Women Institute, Women in the Holocaust International Studies Center at Moreshet, Wagner College Holocaust Center, Classrooms Without Borders, Labine Chair Forum, Washington University, and the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Before I invite Dr. Sharon Geva to give up the opening remarks, just a short introduction. Dr. Geva is a senior lecturer at the Kibbutzim College, and since 2022, a historian at the Ghetto Fighters House. Her first book, To the Unknown Sister, Holocaust Heroines in Israeli Society in Hebrew, she was awarded the 2011 Mordechai Ish Shalom Prize by the Yad Yitzhak Ben Svi Institute in Jerusalem. Her new book, Sidio Lubenkin and Yitzhak Antik Zuckerman, a double biography, will be published soon. And now, Sharon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madin, and thanks everyone uh, for being here. Um, this program is dedicated to women's stories and their experiences, and this is something that brings us um, the, the opportunity to, to discuss questions, topics, issues like the differences between the experiences of men and women during the Holocaust, and also it is a challenge of the question of what we know, which stories uh, we, we know and we're familiar with, and what exactly does it mean uh, as researchers, as women, uh, nowadays also uh, regarding, of course, history. And I thought which women I will try to um, uh, give a few words about uh, in this opening. And I was straight away thinking about Miriam Novich. And Miriam Novich uh, was a documenter and researcher at the Ghetto Fighters House, one of the pioneers of uh, um, the documentaries about the Holocaust. Uh, during the Holocaust, she was uh, a member of the French underground and an inmate in Vitel camp where uh, she met the poet and the educator uh, Yitzhak Katzenelson. She was known as the woman who saved his poem, Hashir uh, ala Yehudishen Neherag, the song uh, of the murdered Jewish people. And after the war, she helped founding um, uh, the institution that uh, we're talking about just today, the Ghetto Fighters House, Bet Lochamea Getaot, after uh, Yitzhak uh, Katzenelson. She was a major activist of the collections and, and witness testimonies and also, uh, she she wrote books and many articles about uh, about the Holocaust. She dedicated her life uh, to Holocaust memorial and also uh, practically to documentation, which is very interesting because while we would like to know about Miriam Novich's private story, it's not that simple because she was not eager uh, to to tell it because it didn't seem important to her the fact that she has her own story. And uh, during uh, the 80s, um, when uh, Tzvika Dror from Kibbutz Lochamea Getaot made a huge documentation project of his own, which is called the Pei Edut, Pages of Testimonies, and he was asking uh, the Haverim in Kibbutz uh, Lochamea Getaot, the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, to tell their story, he also went to Miriam Novich and asked her to tell he, her story. And she said that this is her own words. I've got some individual pieces, not everything, just kind of an outline. And she said, if I write my, my story, it won't be about myself because I still don't have time for that. I have so many uh, documents to, to collect. And she also told him, and it is kind of a shock, I think, just to hear this uh, sentence. She said, I have no biography. I dedicated uh, my life uh, to to one issue, which is never uh, to forget, and she she passed away in 1990. And a few years before uh, she passed away, she said, "I have dedicated my life to fill the promise that I made to Itzhak Nelson, uh, which said, he told her before she was dead. He said, she said to him, uh, uh, she, 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 he said to her, please uh, promise me.'" 
uh, that you will collect the tears of the Jewish people, which is such a beautiful sentence to to collect the tears of the tears of the Jewish uh, people. And I think uh, that today in in or also in the following um, uh, events. We still collect the tears of the Jewish people, but uh, today it is a good example, and, and also the other lectures, uh, about trying to collect the tears of the Jewish women. Um, so thank you, Madin, and thank you for everyone here. And uh, we won't waste any time and, and begin the first uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much for your words, and thank you for reminding us about uh, Miriam Nogic. Um, and now I would like to introduce our guest speakers. Dr. Rochelle G. Seidel is the founder and executive director of Remember the Women Institute, which since 1997 has conducted research and cultural activities that contribute to including women in history, especially Holocaust history. She is co-editor of Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust and coordinator of the 2018 exhibit, exhibition Violated, Women in Holocaust and Genocide shown in a New York City gallery. She's the author or editor of eight books and numerous book chapters and articles on the Holocaust and has lectured internationally on the subject for more than 40 years. She received her PhD in political science from the Graduate School and University Center, City University of New York, and was a research fellow at Yad Vashem, Jerusalem, Israel, and the Center for the Study of Women and Gender, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And our second speaker, because we're gonna be uh, doing this program a little differently today with both speakers going on and off in sort of like a dialogue. So I'm gonna introduce immediately our second speaker, Dr. Sonia M. Hedgepeth. And she is also co-editor of Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust. And she is professor of German at Middle Tennessee State University where she has long taught on the Holocaust as well as Jewish writers and civilization. Dr. Hedgepeth is also one of the founders of the Middle Tennessee State University Holocaust Conference. In the field of German literature, her research focuses on the exile of Jewish intellectuals from Nazi Germany, including the important Jew and Jewish author, Elsa Lasker Schuler. And with that, I would like to give the floor to our two speakers today. Thank you. Shalom from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I'm Dr. Sonia Hedgepeth. And I'm coming to you today about 40 miles southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you for that moving introduction, Sharon. And while we gather the tears of the Jewish women as we continue to do that, perhaps we can begin to dry our own tears. Nadine, thank you for your introduction. Thank you for the work that you do to put these series and make it together and make them available. And uh, your pronunciation of the German Jewish author, Elze Lasker Schuler was spot on. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us, Medine and Lohame Hageta Ot, to discuss sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust challenges and reflections. Despite our intercontinental divide, we will be making this presentation together. Shalom Rochelle, where are you? Shalom Sonia, I am at the moment in uh, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, and uh, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see everybody and I join you in thanking Loha Meha Geta'od and Medine and Sharon for her introduction. Um, for, for more than 25 years, Remember the Women Institute has been dedicated to giving women their place in history, especially Holocaust history, and telling their stories. You can learn about our activities at rememberwomen.org. One of our interests has been the often overlooked subject of sexual violence during the Holocaust. When Sonia and I began investigating this subject more than 20 years ago, we very often came up against a brick wall. However, we found some cracks in the wall among a small group of scholars. And by 2006, we thought that a book on the subject of sexual violence during the Holocaust was in order, or maybe I should say it was uh, perhaps overdue. 
and we began to seek out these scholars for chapters in the book. The result was the collection of scholarly presentations in our um, anthology that we edited. And we can show the book cover perhaps. Um, I'd like to just read the dedication even though you can see it because I think that it's important. This book is dedicated to the victims of sexual violence during the Holocaust, those who were silenced, those who have spoken out, and those who have chosen to remain silent. And uh, this last uh, group, unfortunately, was, uh, was one reason that it took so long to get to going on this. They, they had the right to choose to be silent, but uh, we couldn't get their stories. The book was published in 2010 by Brandeis University Press, along with Remember the Women Institute. Sonia and I are going to um, divide speaking about the five sections of the book. Um, I think I'm supposed to be on the screen and not Sonia, but it's okay. I'll start with uh, the first chapter, or the I don't mean the first section, excuse me, uh, it has actually four chapters. And Sonia and I are going to divide this. Sonia's going to do the next three chapters, then I'm going to return the next three categories. I'm going to return with the last, the fifth category, and then I'm going to talk about two events that followed. And um, you're going to see some images before each of the um, sections of the book. And four of the five of them are from this later event I'm going to talk about, um, which is Remember the Women Institute's 2018 exhibition, Violated Women in Holocaust and Genocide. Um, OK, the first section is called Aspects of Sexual Abuse. And um, Yoni, you should put me on the screen after this slide, uh, but leave it on one second because I want people to see the Hebrew above. This is, this is by Muriel Helfman, uh, a tapestry. She did several beautiful tapestries. It's from a famous photo of the Lvov, now Lviv, but then Lvov ghetto. And it, it sums up the situation uh, this is a quote from Lamentations or Echa 52. My foes have snared me like a bird without any cause. And I think that pretty much sub sums things up. Okay, now let me show you. These are the four chapters in this particular section of the book, Aspects of Sexual Abuse. So you see them, Nomi Levenkron, Brigitte Halbmeier, Robert Sommer, and Kirsty Chatwood. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about it. I'm not gonna go over the, all the details of, of these chapters um, because it's too long and we don't have time. So I think I just wanna tell you a little bit about behind the scenes in a couple of them because I think it's interesting. The first one, Death and the Maidens, Prostitution, Rape and Sexual Slavery During World War II is by Nomi Levenkron. And she is actually an Israeli human rights lawyer and a professor uh, who deals with prostitution and trafficking of women in Israel today. And she in 2008 realized that some of her ideas of what was going on in, in Israel then had something also to do with perhaps what went on in the Holocaust. And so she began researching, researching sexual violence during the Holocaust. And the result was her 2008 essay, which was in Hebrew in a journal, in a Hebrew language journal, Theory and Criticism. And we reached out to her after we saw this journal quite by accident in a Jerusalem bookstore. And so she wrote one of the chapters for us. Um, Robert Sommer's chapter on sexual exploitation of women in Nazi concentration camp brothels was problematic for us. Uh, he had done extensive research regarding the um, brothel in Auschwitz 
and he had seen every little petic, every little piece of paper. Uh, the women had to be examined medically, whatever, whatever. And he insisted that no Jewish women were quote unquote employed as sex slaves in the Nazi brothels. Uh, but there was other testimony that contradicts this, especially in smaller camps. And we finally got him to admit maybe at least even in Auschwitz, provable or not, there could have been Jewish women passing as Catholic uh, uh, Poles and they were forced prostitutes. And it was true that he had some evidence that one was a, a madam in charge of the, the uh, brothel who was Jewish. Um, it, I, I, it may be even surprising some people about the brothel, and I'll say something about it in a minute. The other two chapter authors, uh, Brigitte Halbmeier and uh, Kirsty Chatwood, uh, they have equally important messages, but in the interest of time, I hope the chapter titles are more or less explanatory. So I just want to go on and talk about several aspects of sexual violence that are sometimes um, misunderstood or overlooked. I just want to um, briefly touch on these aspects and see that it's clear. First of all, we have Rasenschande, which is racial shaming in, in a, a, a translation. And people say that because of this Rasenschande, which is defiling the Aryan race by having uh, sex with a non-Aryan, a Jew or some other untermensch, uh, that there couldn't have been rape because why would it, why would a, a, a good German rape a, a Jewish woman? And it's absolutely false. We know that good German soldiers, guards, etc., raped Jewish women. And this entire Rassenschande 1935 Nuremberg laws, it really had to do with consens consensual sex. It didn't have to do with rape. And it's not, uh, it can't be used for an excuse to say that Jewish women were not raped. So I want to make that clear. I want to bring up something that Sonia is going to later talk about our um, beloved friend Nava Semmel, who died way too soon. And I won't say much about her now, except that she's the one that taught us that every woman who entered any camp in the entry process was sexually violated. And um, she was naked, she was probed, et cetera, and so forth. And let me get to the brothels. They existed. They existed to a larger extent than we still know. There were brothels for, for, for Nazi soldiers. There were brothels for guards. And crazy as it may seem, there were brothels for non-Jewish concentration camp inmates. So for these male inmates, this was a reward or an incentive to work harder. So they would increase their slave labor output. And crazy as it is, the female slave laborers were the prostitutes who these, who were servicing, quote unquote, these uh, male slave laborers. And last, there were also personal sex slaves. And I, I think, you know, in the Schindler's List story, you, you, you know one of those stories that, that you've seen even in the movie, but the one we were most familiar with was in Auschwitz, there was a testimony in, in um, Shoah Foundation from Manya Horowitz. And uh, sometimes we show it. We don't have time to show it this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are. But um, it, it, she was picked because she was beautiful. And this Nazi um, high level uh, guard or SS person in Auschwitz chose her and she she was his personal sex slave and she testi testified about it and she surely was not the only one. So now I'm going to uh, give the uh, floor, so to speak, or the screen to Sonia and she's going to present information about the sections two, three, and four of the book, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, then I'll come back. I will be a bit repetitive, but 
sometimes when you're listening, I'm sure to hear it again, it's like, oh, to reinforce some things. During wartime, rape has always been part of enemy violence against women. We see this in Ukraine today. And this was no less true for Jewish women during the Shoah. Had the topic of sexual assault during the Holocaust been shrouded in a cloud of secrecy only because of the shame associated to it for the victim? Was it not also a fact that silence allowed the perpetrator to hide and evaporate in the fog of denial? And I saw a question pop up, what allowed for uh, sexual violence to happen against Jewish women at this time. And um, Doris Bergen has aptly said in her book on Holocaust and genocide that behind the war, these things could happen is the short answer for this. It's a good question. Next slide, please, Yoni. So I won't go into all the chapters. Like Rochelle said, they're really full of uh, information, I invite you to examine them. And I'll leave the titles up while I say a few words. Uh, I do want to thank uh, publicly the researchers, the scholars who shared their knowledge with us in this book, Monica Flaschka, Anatoly Podolsky, and Helene Sinrich, Zoe Waxman, who contributed to the second section of the book on rape. I would like to remind everyone that all the scholarship in this book is supported by thorough research. Reluctance to think and talk about sexual violence enacted against victims during the Holocaust in the past was blocked, as Rochelle had said, just by the word Vassenschande. And as Rochelle has already informed us, Rassenschande, this law could not be used to talk away, to discount rape of Jewish women during the Shoah. Sexual violation in all forms was facilitated by the coercive environment in which German men and their henchmen had complete control the German men and their helpers had complete control in the environment and Jewish women were completely vulnerable. Next slide. The next section is of the book of the anthology is titled Assault on Motherhood. Jewish women, were sexually violated in hiding, in the ghettos, in the killing fields. Nazi experiments in Auschwitz included sexual assault on the bodies of Jewish women, Jewish mothers, and on the bodies of Jewish uh, women in the form of sterilization. Next slide. Two of the chapter authors who uh, contributed their knowledge to our anthology, Hedda Amesberger and Ellen Ben Safer. As you heard in three weeks on Sunday, February 19, Dr. Beverly Chalmers will speak in more detail about her own research on birth, sex, and abuse during the Holocaust and don't forget to join us for that conversation. Jewish women were sexually violated during the entrance process to the concentration camps. As you heard Rochelle say, the Israeli author Nava Semel directing our noses, getting our attention, making it clear about that fact. Upon close reading of testimonies and memoirs, you will find that some women indeed themselves referred to the vaginal examination conducted during their entrance to the camp as sexual molestation. A few years ago, a young German scholar 
Kristin Zülke shared a document with me. She shared a document written in 1943 that states it's a, a document written by a member of the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz, in which he states that in many cases, German SS men of all ranks touched the sexual organ of every naked young woman entering the gas bunker, and that many even put their fingers in sexual organs of young, pretty women. Next slide, Yoni, please. Our fourth section of the anthology is dedicated to sexual violence, the, dedicated to the topic of sexual violence in literature and cinema. Witnessing through literature, film, and art is most important. And I mean, not the most important thing, very important. While memoirs and books on history are primary texts through which we learn about the event, literature, that is fiction, also has its place in the study of the Shoah. Fiction is at times dismissed since the word can mean invention or fabrication. It's about imagination. However, the descriptive creative process of good literary fiction that is grounded in fact can guide us to approach new subjects through our own imagination and awaken our curiosity and our compassion. The imagination of the writer, the filmmaker, the artist, and the reader, the viewer, is a powerful way to make connections beyond the constraints of the history textbook. Next slide. In the section on uh, literature and cinema, contributors are Lillian, Hel uh, Lillian Hellman, that's a good one, right? Lillian Kramer, Miriam Sivan, Yvonne Kozlovsky golan as well as a contribution from the two of us, Rochelle, and from me. You heard Nava Semel already. I hope in Israel, many of you or most of you are familiar with her work, your true national treasure to my mind. If you are not familiar with it, I would like to recommend to all of you the book And the Rat Left by the Israeli writer Nava Semel. In 2001, it appeared in Hebrew, Tzchok, Shel Ach Barosh, in 2007 in German, Und die Ratte lacht, and then in 2008 in English. In her novel, And the Rat Laughed, this important Israeli writer created a Holocaust story about a small Jewish girl hidden in a potato pit on a Polish farm. And at the center of her creative work is the rape of the girl in the pit. Before I turn the picture back to Rochelle, I just would like to say that in light of our anthology, Rochelle and I have received queries of a personal nature over the years. I would like to think that the book had a real or had the real life effect of giving courage to individuals grappling with accounts of sexual violence during the Holocaust in their own family narratives. And now I'm going to turn it back to Rochelle, who will discuss the last section of the book. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, the last section you're going to see uh, the, the slide now, the violated self. I happen to, this was part of our, our, our 2018 exhibit, but this was really, I thought this kind of said it all about being a violated self as far as being 
uh, sexually violated by Hannah Shear, a, an Israeli artist. And, and I thought it was a very powerful, very strong image. It's done in, in fabric and embroidery, and there are pins sticking into these women. And I, I, I just, this was something that really spoke to me. So I, I just thought I would mention it. Uh, the next slide gives the chapters, which there are two. Uh, sexual abuse of Jewish women during and after the Holocaust, a psychological uh, perspective is by Eva Fogelman, who is a New York psychotherapist who's very well known for her work with um, children of survivors, survivors. She herself is a child of survivors. I, I've known her so long, I can't remember when I met her. And um, she, the other is, um, is by an Israeli team, Esther Dror and, and Ruth Lynn, the shame is always there. And uh, also with extensive um, interviews with, uh, with survivors. So um, as far as uh, both of them are concerned, I mean, they, 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 as psychotherapists, and I'm not a psychotherapist, and sometimes when I've interviewed survivors, I've kind of been a little scared because I'm not a psychotherapist and I brought up something that I was afraid I couldn't handle when I was speaking to the to to the survivor but but um you know uh, Eva and Esther and Ruth knew how to speak to the survivors and they have some incredible testimony and uh I think that one of one of um Eva's stories that uh, of, of an interview was even sadder than everything because it was a child survivor that was then placed with a foster family in, in New York and, and, and was abused some more. So uh, they really had some, some psychological perspectives on, on what these girls and women went through. And um, I'm going, that, that kind of, um, is the end of the book. That was the last section of the book. But uh, before Sonia joins me to end the program, I want to just talk briefly about two other notable events that really grew out of the book. So um, the next slide, and I'm going to leave that picture up while I just talk a little bit. This was in 2012 and in November. And together with the Shoah Foundation at USC, remember the Women Institute organized a symposium of about 20 scholars and experts to discuss the subject of sexual violence during the Holocaust. And I believe this was a first. And uh, we made an impact. For example, people began discussing about the sensitivity when you're interviewing victims and it raised awareness. And, and the, the, the 20 people were in various, um, uh, you know, related fields. And, and we had a public event, which again, uh, Nava Semel, the name keeps coming up. Um, the, the woman in the middle who you may recognize, um, not not me next to me is Jane Fonda and we had a public uh event and Jane Fonda read from Nava Semmel's and the rat laughed and Jane Fonda had a handkerchief in her hand and the whole time and was kind of crying her way through it so um the other people are Dan Lesh uh, left to right Dan Lesham of the Shoah Foundation Dr. Eva Fogelman Jessica Newworth of Equality Now, uh, who was a co-sponsor of the public event, myself and Sonia and Karen Schulman, who worked with us in Remember the Women Institute. And let's not leave out uh, Jane's service dog, uh, Julia, who is in the bottom left. So that was that event. And then we can, um, go on to the next event, which has already been mentioned, which is our exhibition, Violated Women in Holocaust and Genocide. And it was um, 
It was in the Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York in Soho, which is a gallery area. The exhibition curator was um, Dr. Batu Bruton. And uh, as you can see, my name is coordinator. And so this exhibit was um, in the Ronald Feldman Gallery. So let me just say a few words about Ronald Feldman. Unfortunately, he died last month and uh, we miss him very much. He believed in us. He gave us the space in his gallery with great generosity and his ideas for the exhibit. He didn't just say, here's the space. He, he, he shared his ideas and he made it a better exhibition. I know Bhatti would agree with me. And um, so we thank him and we, we will always thank him. And you saw some of the artwork from the exhibition earlier. And I wanna show a few more images kind of quickly. There were 30 artists from six countries and um, the artwork did include later genocides also. And so the first slide here just shows some of the art coming in. This is Judy Chicago's famous uh, Holocaust project, which was so big that we had to use a half scale uh, that she did of it. And uh, it even that almost didn't fit on the wall. And, and uh, you saw some of the close-ups of it um, in one of the sections that Sonia was talking about before. So we're gonna see now again, the next slide is Judy Chicago. And you can see the scenes of the um, violence and the sexual violence and how she superimposed them on some famous things. Like on the right, that's that famous picture that Elie Wiesel is in and she's got the women being violated above it. Um, next is very important to show because we borrowed it from the ghetto fighters house in Loha Meha Ghetto Oat. We borrowed three uh, pieces of art that were done in or right after the Holocaust. And this is by Ze'ev Porat. And he did it outside of his window, watching this um, uh, in a work camp in 1942-43. He, he, he was he had a job to do drawings, but not this. And he secretly tried to document, and you can see the horror of, of the torture of the women, of the particular, the one woman, and then even in the back with the naked women. Um, next, please. Gil Yefman is a young um, Israeli artist working today. This is one of his sex slaves. And one of the uh, media he likes to work with, which this is, is crochet. And um, this was in the in the in the Feldman Gallery, he did a different one for a, a couple of years later. That was in the um, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which you may have seen if you were in Israel. You may have seen this one if you were in New York. Um, and you know, I, I just I'll say it while I remember it. At RememberWomen.org, there is the complete catalog of this exhibition, and you can see it. So anybody that wants to see the whole thing with also some scholarly um, essays, please do so. Um, next, and I'm almost out of time, but that's maybe good. Um, this is called Untitled or Corset with Stars of David. And it was done in 1982 by Boris Lurie, who is a Latvian uh, Holocaust survivor. And he started something uh, and I think in the 60s in New York, he, he survived, came to New York, the no art uh, um, movement. And uh, now after his death um, in 2008, uh, he, his work has been very much, uh, it's very popular. There have been exhibits all over in Europe and, and in um, New York and and I think that um, what he did from his Holocaust uh, art is very moving. There's a big exhibit, I think it's still on in the Museum of Jewish Heritage of, of his um, Holocaust works. And he lost his mother, his sisters, his girlfriend, all were murdered. And this 
is his reaction to it in a lot of his art. So um, also a foundation connected with the memory of his sisters uh, was very helpful to remember the Women Institute in helping to um, fund this exhibit and get us off the ground so that we were able to do it. So we were very grateful to the foundation and and um, and and we think that uh, this is a very important um, piece of art. I want to mention one other piece of art. There's no slide, Yoni, so you can't show it. Nancy Sparrow was a very important, famous um, Jewish American artist, and the way her uh, her her estate was set up after her death, you cannot show her art unless you have a license and you pay money and all kinds of things so you can get sued. So I'm not showing her art. And the funny thing is, I now own a piece. Of, I, I own this piece of art and I'm not allowed to show it, but that's the way it works. And it's called the Yudenhura Marie Sanders. She did it in 1991. She not only showed a, a graphic of a woman all bound, but she she um, wrote in kind of Gothic uh, in uh, the script, German old script, a poem by Bertolt Brecht. And this is about Rassenschanda. And um, uh, Judenhora, quote unquote, Marie Sanders, the Jewish whore, uh, was a German woman who married a man whose hair was too dark in, uh, in Brecht's words. In other words, a Jew. And so I think it's a, such a strong, fabulous uh, thing, but I'm very sorry I can't show it to you. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and last, let me just show you one more, um, uh, just to give you an idea. We had, we had several, the emphasis was on the Holocaust, but in the end, we, we, we had some, some later genocides. We had the Yazidi, we had um, Guatemala, we had uh, um, uh, Rwanda, we had Sudan. Uh, if I'm leaving something out, I probably am. Uh, but this was Yazidi Girls by uh, Rostam Agala. And, uh, you know, it kind of shows like it went on and uh, still goes on and continues uh, this this uh, sexual violence uh, with you know connected with with genocide. So um, I'm now going to we're just about on time. Good. I'm now going to ask Sonia to join me so we can both be together in our little squares. <laughs> and um, so and, may I may I say something? Yeah, you're. I was going to say gotten? Sonia's going to speak first. Yes. <laughs> You know, because I saw a shout out go across the uh, in the chat and it, and there's this whole life in the chat that I would like to be in there with all of you. But I saw twice the name Judy Cohen of Toronto. Yes, and she I said she'd be not, with us. I do not want to miss say, expressing around the world my gratitude to Judy. And mine. Weisenberg Cohen, because she, she's in our introduction. She is the rock. She is the person who uh, has supported women who are investigating the Holocaust. She has her website. She is loved. So I just would be remiss not to say it. And thank you for the person to the person who did the shout out. Okay, and, and, and I mean, let us say that she is a, a Hungarian Holocaust survivor. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. you can go ahead, Sonia. I talked uh, so another much. another question that I saw just go briefly by was how do I interview a Holocaust survivor? Because I would like to interview someone. Um, I think we all work together, so I don't think I'm advertising for any competition. We don't have competition, we must work together. And if you haven't seen it this coming Tuesday, January 31st, uh, Carly Snyder, who is speaking, uh, it's uh, uh, sponsored by 
the uh, Dorf, I, I want to say right, the USC Dornsif Center for Advanced Genocide Research and the USC Shoah Foundation. And her talk will be on questions of gender and sexuality in interviewer trainings and Holocaust survivor testimonies. And maybe Rochelle, you want to address just how, why the interviews, early ones didn't have much about sexual violence? Well, I mean, beside the, the shame of any woman that didn't want to speak about it, I think that there was, uh, there was also some embarrassment in the early interviewers and they, they either didn't want to uh, ask or they didn't even think to ask. And I, I know we watched something from, I think it was the Shoah Foundation. I don't know, we watched so many interviews, but that, um, that, uh, that this was unbelievable that, that a survivor began to talk about being raped and the, and, and the interviewer said, um, and what did your family eat for Shabbat dinner? And uh, I think that kind of sums it up with, I think you're all smart enough to, <laughs> I don't have to spell out any more with that. Um, Sonia, we wanted to mention uh, all beside Judy Cohen, who was a pioneer with this and, you know, has a, 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 a website and, and so on. We wanted to mention uh, uh, Joan Ringelheim and uh, Myrna Goldenberg, who were two uh, other pioneers in, in beginning to, uh, work on, on, on the issue of sexual violence. Absolutely. And I, while it sounds high handed, I don't mean it this way, but I would also like to know, I know that several of our friends and researchers are uh, watching this. I would like to command and thank those who in the beginning had her own doubts, plural, about her as in plural. I don't want to just say there. Uh, doubts about were women raped in Auschwitz. I'll just make that as the code. Um, and have opened their hearts because it's not just opening your mind. It's listening to the silence and hmm, I'll say courage, have the courage to imagine because it's hard to, you know, who wants to imagine these things and to accept that these are the truths of the past. And when new information comes out or new thought about our subject matter, often when I've taught, students said, how could that happen? I have learned to tell myself whatever I could not imagine happened. What I can't imagine happened during the Holocaust. So inviting everyone's courage because uh, Rochelle, we have to say that going on this uh, project was very difficult. It was met with resistance at every turn. We really, really started seriously in 2006. And the good report is that the lay of the land is a little, land is a little different. I can't name all the new researchers who are working on this and are finding out things in documents and testimony. You will recall if you were at the program from Lohameha Geta Ot that was on Ukraine and refugees, where Marta Parishko spoke about sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust, bringing focus to testimonies from Ukraine and the Soviet Union. For us, her work is very important and for all of your work. And what Mata brought to light, she had and has access to archives in Russia that we don't have. We cannot access it because first of all, I can't read Russian, I don't know any Russian. Me so, too. so East European, everyone's, but East European uh, research helps ground out the picture. It's even fuller than we can think right now. Yeah, we knew that that was missing and, and when we did the book and we just couldn't find anybody that was going to go into those archives and, you know, in, in Moscow and, and, and now finally it's being done and it's really a very important addition to it. And I, I just want to say, Sonia said it was 
hard when we were working. And I, I know she'll say the same about me, but I just want to say I couldn't have done it without her. We really were like a two person support system for each other. And um, yes, and, and that's how it got done. Why did you take the words out of my mouth? I well, want to because that's yourself. why. That's why. <laughs> for your friendship and your partnership of over 25 years, probably 27 years if we count. And I know before we leave and before we say time's up, tomorrow is Rochelle's birthday. Oh, in no. Israel, it's in <laughs> two hours. And you Please. have come a long way, baby. So I want to thank you, you Sonia. Happy birthday, uh, Maydeen. Do you have uh, viewer questions, or should we just keep talking? Hi, to end? I'm. I'm just listening to you guys talk. So yes, there are <laughs> questions. And happy birthday, of course. Now the chat box is filling up. Um, there are some interesting questions. First of all, people are answering questions uh, throughout. But um, one of the questions that someone was also answering was about Jewish men. Uh, quickly, because that isn't our main subject, but of course, obviously the question is, were Jewish men also uh, raped? Um, and maybe, maybe in a circ what kind of, in what kind of uh, situations or circumstances throughout your um, research did you find those kind of examples? That's one question. I'm going to say another question, one or two questions, so that you can decide what you want to talk about. By the way, okay. our last program, our last uh, uh, program will be about um, uh, after liberation. And we do have uh, uh, Dinah that does know Russian or Ukrainian. She's here. She can write it in the chat box. And she will. And she does have access to these um, document documents. Right. And she can share that with us. So that's going to be our last program at the end of March. Um, someone asked about, and this is interesting, in the German documents, is there any recognition of rape? For example, were any of the German soldiers ever brought to trial uh, mm -hmm. within the Nazi regime? Was it brought up? I know there was probably regulations and rules, but any kind of punishment, any kind of uh, uh, recognition that this happened uh, during the Holocaust? So that's a, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, Somebody wrote about abortions, um, and I think that'll be the last question. Now, uh, it was very interesting to see one of the answers because uh, someone was saying, "Yeah, abortions were uh, considered uh, taboo in uh, the Nazi regime, uh, German women, but for women that was for Jewish women that was free access." No, I don't think we're talking about abortion as something that you could freely get. We have to talk about in what situations were uh, Jewish women um, sent. To, to have abortion. So that would be uh, another interesting uh, question. Um, and I think maybe the last question is about our awareness today. I know our program is here to raise awareness, but thing. since you wrote the book um, and um, a few years have gone by, do you see more awareness concerning this subject? I think I know the answer, Rochelle, and I talked about this, but do you see more awareness, maybe more, I don't want to say acceptance, but an understanding uh, that this is a subject that needs to be discussed more openly? Uh, so that's uh, my last question. Is there any documentation in German research that there were trials of uh, soldiers who raped? Soldiers, yeah. Yes, but not in particular uh, Jewish women. There was a case, but that it was more not more than a slap on the wrist. And I believe the researcher, her last name is Bock, B-O-C-K. And C I, I, I'll say the wrong name, but yes, there is research into that. Um okay. Men. Um, yes, men were raped, men were abused. Uh that's not our research. Uh so we didn't cover it. But absolutely, and you know, there's the pee pill with the the the, uh, the the young boy that would be the sex slave of of uh, a capo or a guard. Or a, yes, it's not our research, and yes, it happened. Uh, the trials we covered. What about uh, Ronnie Salnat's film? What? Oh, oh. Ronnie Salnat's film, where men are. Oh yeah, she interviewed oh. men. Ronnie Sarnat has a film called Screaming Silence that was in Hebrew and then we got English subtitles for it. We showed it a couple of times in New York, but I, it's hard to, to get it shown, I, I don't know. Uh, but yes, she did interview um, men. 
um, uh, abortion. Uh, what exactly? I mean, there were abortions. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if a woman was going to be kept alive in a concentration camp, uh, she, she shouldn't be pregnant. Although I, I, I read an extraordinary story this week in one of the in English language Israeli uh, papers, I don't remember which, about a baby that was born at the end of 1945. Five and she's alive today and she was born in a concentration camp and kept alive it was like extraordinary but very rare and we have a story uh, in the chat box Rochelle now someone just wrote that in uh January 16th 1945 in Muldorf uh subcamp of Dachau the only baby to be born and allowed to live in that camp that's it then. Uh, yeah. So, and she also wrote her, um, she put her email in and she can be reached, uh, Lynn A. Barbman. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. So there you go. And yeah. about- but I mean, that, but I mean, if you read, the, but the, but the real thing was because this was so you know, extraordinary. Uh, I, for example, you know, Gisela Pearl, I was a doctor in Auschwitz and that came across in the chat too. I don't even know what it said. It went so fast, but yeah. <laughs> she did. I don't know. Uh, many, 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 I don't know a number, abortions to keep the mother alive. Because if the mother, if the woman was pregnant, she was, you know, headed for for certain death. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, I think someone wrote earlier on, I saw in the chat, you know, that, that, and this is true, this was a very, and I think maybe Beverly's going to talk about this, you know, the difference between the, 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 uh, the rules for the German women and the rules for the Jewish right. women, because right. German women weren't supposed to have an abortion because exactly. they were supposed to be making babies for the fatherland. But the Jewish women, you know, well, you know, anyhow, didn't want There's, the women there, or there, the babies. <laughs> there are a few babies in the chat box. Um, I'll, I'll send you the chat anyway, because it's interesting, right? right. As Sonia okay, was saying, please, there are please. some interesting uh, stories here. But there was one more question that someone really asked to ask, and it is interesting, right? Because we're talking about perversion as well. Do you, uh, did you also find in your research about women raping women? Because the opportunity presented itself. Were there also examples of, uh, of uh, women uh, guards attacking uh, women prisoners? Did that come up in your research at all in any of the... Um... In Five Chimneys by Olga Lenyol, there is a depiction of, is it in Auschwitz? I don't have it like on the real present in the front of my head that there is a sex slave of- um, Bins, on, was it a Bins? Emma Grise. It's in mm-hmm. five chimneys. And uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, isn't it Nava Semmel's uh, Hat of Glass? That where she takes the was, it, yeah yes and in, in in that and yes in Navasemel's uh, short story Hat of Glass that was the subject yeah right. it's based on, it's on in, put it in Yo, and young, she said that was chat. based on a story that her mother knew Navasemel said that yeah um the last thing you asked us though was about awareness today yeah. And I think that the answer is yes. I think we're living in different times. I think that, you know, uh, women were much more, especially young women, they were more protected. Some of them, you know, they didn't even know what sex was. They didn't know anything when they when they right. came into the camps. And, and, you know, I mean, now I think it's, it's a much more open, uh, you know, we have the Me Too movement and we have all kinds of things going on. And so I think that the awareness today is is definitely, um, you know, uh, there and it wasn't there then. And and the shame was terribly there. And uh, yeah. I, especially stories you heard from Israel, you know, that any survivor that arrived was pretty. Oh, the only way she could have survived what was if, if she, you know, gave her body to the Nazis. I mean, I, I, I knew I knew two women sister survivors and they told me that that, that that happened to them. And they said we were like 14 year old girl. We didn't even know anything, you know. And and, and um, yeah, so I think that we I hope come a long way since then. And I think that the awareness is here. Unfortunately, by the time we've 
come to this, most of the people we should have been talking to about it are no longer with us. So uh, it's kind I of- think also, you know. I think also important is to remember that the shame to, to the perpetrator should be the one that we shame and not the victim. Absolutely. Um, we're over time six minutes at May. Right, it's we're over time six minutes. <laughs> there is no overtime. Uh, we, I always say once we reach uh, the hour mark, if someone wants to leave, they're invited to leave. Those that want to stay with us, stay. But um, I do want to thank you once again, uh, Rochelle and Sonia. What an opportunity for me as a uh, to, 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 to invite you and to have you to give this opening uh, talk. I'm reading the book. It's very difficult. Um, but I recommend, uh, especially for those in the chat box that are saying that they're interested in uh, going into research about uh, women and during the Holocaust, read the book before when you so you can understand what you're getting yourself into. And and thank you for being our pioneers for being the women that said, listen, we need to make this subject uh, open to the public. We need to talk about women's stories, and we have to talk about the struggles that they went through as women. Um, just the number of German uh, uh, descriptions. There's so many German uh, words that are used to describe the different types of sexual violence that you could do against women. It's unbelievable, you know, uh, to think that it's almost like the Eskimos having the word for snow, right? I think a thousand words for snow. There are a thousand ways to describe uh, their cruelty against women. So for us, it was a great opportunity to start the, the ball rolling once again, to keep awareness uh, there and open and out there. And, and, and if we're waiting for everyone for, to come to our next program in three weeks with uh, Dr. Beverly Chalmers. Sony, thank you for my, reminding that. We put the link to register in the chat box and everybody here who registered will also get an invitation to that as well. I wanna thank our partners. We. Um, are very proud to have our partners this time. Many of our partners are working on bringing the story of women, women during the Holocaust to the forefront. Shalom, thank you again for your opening remarks. Shalom Geva also doing incredible work bringing the stories of women uh, out to the public and uh, raising our awareness even more about their stories. And of course, Miriam Novich. And of course, I always say thank you to our audience because you're the ones that makes this happen. You're the reason why we come back to Zoom over and over and over again. And can uh, I just, I want to say, yeah. Maydeen, to thank you and to thank Aloha Meha Ghetto and Ghetto, Ghetto Fighters House, Aloha Meha Ghetto, because I mean, this is a very uh, prestigious um, mainstream institution that is doing this subject and that in itself is how awareness is being raised. So we really thank you. It's a two way street. <laughs> oh, <not too> <laughs> okay, and of course there are a lot of people saying thank you in uh, the chat box. And once again, thank you everyone for coming to this program, for taking part and we will continue. We have a month, almost two months together now to discuss this subject. We hope to see you in our next program in three weeks. Toda. Toda. Thank you.